Thank you all for joining the UCLA Anderson EMBA Experience Leaders in Healthcare event. I'm Sarika, I'm the Executive Director of EMBA Admissions, and this event is always near and dear to my heart every year. I was the Director of Admissions for the medical school for several years prior to this, so I know how important it is to have the intersection of healthcare and business and that merging. So this event is part of a series where we introduce you to the diversity of thought UCLA Anderson provides you as a student. Each event has a different theme or industry featured, and uh, you have the opportunity to learn about that industry within the context of business. So of course, today we're highlighting the healthcare industry. So as we all know, because this has been a crazy year in healthcare and uh, COVID-19 has greatly impacted the healthcare industry. We currently have several Anderson faculty conducting research actually in partnership with UCLA Health to work on um, patient outcomes and the business implications of that. So Professor Fred Hagigi will present on the interaction of healthcare and business and the impact that COVID-19 has had on the healthcare industry. This will be followed by a panel of healthcare professionals and um, their experience in the executive MBA program as alum. Uh, you'll have the experience and the ability to ask questions to them uh, for both the Professor Hagigi and also the panel during the event. Um, we are also going to be uh, putting a link to the series of the of all the different health, uh, sorry, all the different events so you can sign up for events and we welcome you to attend as many of these as you would like. We are also going to post uh, a link to this event. Uh, and we'll send that to you in a link after, after this event. So just a few really quick housekeeping items and then I will stop talking. Uh, we are recording this session and it will be posted on YouTube as an on-demand video after this event. Therefore, please feel free to keep your camera on or leave it off, whatever you prefer. And again, we will have a Q&A session, so please feel free to uh, ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand or ask the questions live to uh, Professor Higigi or our uh, panelists. And we do, again, also wanna let you know that we will have other events that lists uh, and talks about admissions questions specifically. So again, we're gonna be posting a link to uh, those admission specific events in the email that we have as a follow-up. So with that said, I will hand it over to Professor Higigi. I was asked to talk about the, the experience with, you know, specifically related to UCLA. And I thought to start with this, this very much my belief that education is not learning of facts, but training of the minds to think. And one thing that I always share with my students uh, and with my colleagues is that by the time you learn the answers, the questions are changed. And it is always by the type of question that one would ask that you would judge them to see whether they know what they're talking about. And the fact that in majority of cases, there is not one right answer. There are many reasonable answers. And that's what I love about the executive MBA program. And my involvement has been equally as much learning as facilitating other people's learning uh, through that process and the cohort work that is done. So you're here because you probably have thought about the first two for sure. And I would try to put a little bit more emphasis on what you may have already decided of why MBA and why now, but also why here. And that would be coming from through a lens of bias that I have had. And I can assure you that I do teach uh, through many different programs, um, both, you know, in the local industry and, um, you know, in the academics and also at the Wharton and others, both national and international. And I can really say in confidence that UCLA is one of the best because of the way, not only the program, but the campus and the intercollaboration that what we call North Campus and South Campus and I'm, I'm delighted to be seeing a friend and colleague um, that would be part of your panel, Brandon, that I always enjoy listening to him. Uh, the big issue is that the business of healthcare is unlike any other. And I'm going to try to address that in a way to say why I, I say it is unlike any other. We start with the health needs in a, in a system, in a country, and 
you know, in, in the case that I'm in, let's say the uh, system in a veterans administration, for example, and the needs change, and we always try to come up with some, some sort of a, what do we expect in health outcomes? We put resources together, we put management system to bring the service delivery and get the outcome through that. And of course, we have to do adjustments to uh, what we have in the middle in order to be able to get what we want from the outcome. And what we want is not always going to happen because it changes. The system changes, the needs change, and therefore the outcomes will change. Keeping in mind that the objective is to improve quality and or control cost. And there have been different ways of looking at this, people thinking, if I want to improve quality, I'm going to have to in increase cost. And there has been more experiences in my past year of 40 years of living through the history of the healthcare system delivery and so forth is that they are not necessarily, uh, you know, they, you can do both basically. We put system together and we try to make it simple, but this is the most simple that, for example, we, we can see with all the different parts that comes in that I'm sure everyone on this call has experienced either as a patient or as a professional or both. One thing that we forget is that we keep talking about the delivery side of things and, and if we neglect all the other factors that we have that would be part of the determinants of health, and if we do you know, one answer for all, it's not gonna work. So part of this has evolved through population-based healthcare and others, which we will talk about, uh, that this changes substantially because a lot of other factors may not have been addressed in the proper way throughout. Again, unlike any other, why? We have the stakeholders that there is an overlap. And I'm going to say at the end that the normal economic models do not apply. The supply and demand will not apply. And I tell you why. We have as purchasers government, employers, we have individuals. So any of us could be paying through insurance or direct and the contracts that we have with the providers. We have the payers that employers through insurance, government through system of self-insured by delivery, employers that are going to be the payers, individual are going to be payers. So purchases, payers, providers, which we have a whole assortment of uh, clinicians and uh, non-clinicians and allied field Consumers, it's important to remember that when we look at patients uh, in consumers, they're also caretakers that are the consumers. So at, uh, Brandon will address this issue of geriatrics and also with the pediatrics, your, the beneficiary is patients, but uh, you, you have the advocate and the decision maker and the consumer basically is going to be someone other than the patients. And of course, we have the regulators in government associations and so forth. And naturally, if I have somebody else is paying for my hamburger and a good quality hamburger, a nice one would probably be $10. A basic one could be $2, uh, depending on whether I am paying for it or somebody else is paying for it. Naturally, if somebody else is paying for it, I like to have the $10, even the value, if the value is $5, somebody else is paying for it. I might as well get the best of what I think is the best, at least as a consumer. This model practically shows that the categories that we are dealing with in this country and every country, but you know, to focus in, in here is that you have employed and insured. And even as an employed and insured doesn't mean that everything is covered. So I put this as an example of the basic areas that are covered and not 100% by the way, it changes by year, by uh, the group, by the insurance that is covered and the employee and so forth. But the focus a lot comes in in the unemployed and uninsured and the employed and uninsured. At the end of the day, 
when you look at that, the only access that they have through emergency. So there is no ambulatory care. So practically your, your physician, your primary care is the ER. And that's what we have heard about all the issues that we are engaged within the ER. And you have unemployed insured that you pay yourself. Military and the VA, of course, it's a different system altogether. But just to kind of get a sense of what is covered, what is not covered and so forth, that gives you an idea. For the uninsured, uh, there is a safety net. It's the EMTALA, the Emergency Management Treatment Act and, and the Labor Act. And we forget that this was not something that goes back to Medicare and Medicaid of 1965, 1966. This came in as a 1986, and this was an unfunded mandate, basically means that you as a hospital have to provide the service and you're not gonna get paid for it. So there are some payments, you know, they call it disproportionate share and so forth that you get a little bit more for your Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement if you have too many uninsured, but all of those constantly change and hospitals always have this as a point of their loss and uh, part of the community service and what have you, but this is important to remember. And many countries still don't have this, meaning that if you end up behind the emergency room, then that means you can bleed to death uh, if it's a private hospital until somebody would take you to a public hospital. So we take it for granted as if it has been there forever. If you end up going from each direction or both, you're going to have to get yourself to an ER or you know, as an uninsured, for example, but good luck because if you, uh, the Amtala does not cover you for ambulance. So if you call the 911 and you end up having a hospital uh, transfer, you are going to be personally responsible for this and they will extract it out of you somehow and a lot more than if you were insured. Once you get to the ER, whether conscious or unconscious, you're going to have to have this wallet biopsy done on you. And if it's benign, that means you're going to be transferred. So the idea is that the responsibility of the ER is to stabilize you to the point that you would not die in their ground to the best of their ability. And then the social worker will transfer you somewhere that somebody can take care of you that it would not cost their system. And there is no difference of where we do this. Back again to the quality and cost. If you want to look at cost, you follow the dollar. If you want to look at quality, you follow the patients. So the issue is that again, these are constantly changing. The issue is that can we combine it and that don't get lost. And all the things that on daily basis, on hourly basis, uh, clinicians like Brandon have to deal with that uh, how much of my time as a clinician should be going to do the right thing for the patient and how much of my time should be uh, spent on making sure that doing the right thing for the patient is not going to bankrupt the patient. The healthcare has been evolving and uh, those of us who've been in the system long enough have seen it going from fee for service uh, to you know, the shared risk to all sorts of different games and at the end of the day is that forcing different types of clinicians to, to adjust and pay a lot more time, spend a lot more time to do things that they don't like to do uh, instead of things that uh, would be taking care of patients and so forth. So the system is very complicated. There has been moves to value quality and efficiency uh, called value-based system that both uh, nationally, internationally is going in, in that direction. And, uh, and I would talk about that a little bit more. Population-based healthcare that we, we look at in which communities do we need to be focusing on what kind of delivery, for example, do I have more chronic cares in one certain area of community geographically or uh, ethnically? And then of course, going into the patient-centered care that you would be part of the managed care system is supposed to have been doing that. We have been trying to do that uh, within VA 
and not to a complete success. And again, changes from depending on the leadership and the vision and so forth. And of course, uh, uh, when it comes to connectivity, uh, be it wearables, be it telehealth and all different kinds of use of technology uh, in this form of connection, uh, COVID has accelerated that process by, by necessity. And, and the artificial intelligence, even in when it comes to our telehealth is going to play a prominent role as we move forward and uh, there are good things and bad things. And, um, and hopefully we, we can make the difference of hopefully providing more access as a result of more efficiency in this area. When it comes to area of value-based value uh, for healthcare and focus factory, we have this even through the insurance payments and the systems that they practically, the insurance company would say, yes, I'm gonna pay for your, uh, for, for your bypass. However, I would pay 100% if you go, let's say to Cedar Sinai, I would pay 90% if you go to UCLA and I would pay 50% if you go to St. John's. And these are based on how many they do and what kind of contract they have. So basically people come into the centers of excellence and quaternary type of hospitals, let's say UCLA is internationally known for its uh, kidney transplants. And, and of course, a lot of people, if you, especially if you're self-insured, you're going to end up going to other places, uh, both nationally and internationally. An example of this is what you have as one of the very high caliber, high quality uh, hospitals that uh, in addition, you know, everybody thinks about, okay, knee, knee replacement, hip transplant, those are easy, but we have uh, basically the heart hospital that it's uh, no frill, no air conditioning, no nothing. But part of the process is that right from day one, there is patient and family engagement in the process. So a lot of uh, countries have been pushing on this uh, medical travel, medical tourism within their countries. Of course, COVID has put a stop to that also, but we have it nationally and within the same uh, area. Here's the question that I want to leave you with, and I will tell you a little bit more at the end. Is COVID a new normal or is it a black swan? And we do have uh, nationally, there is this sense of, you know, I'm resilient, uh, I, I would have survived everything, and uh, this too shall pass and so forth. But there is more to be thought about this depending on, I personally, again, my bias is that we have never in this country experienced the kind of breaking at the seams uh, when it comes to search capacity issues and other factors of how do we balance independence and freedom of individual with other public health related issues. Talking about Anderson School, it's been an absolutely fantastic place uh, for me working with colleagues and uh, those who come in for education. Uh, this is one of the projects, the, the CAP course that starts uh, in January of the second year and goes for six months. It has different projects. You can start your own business uh, with your team and so forth, or you can be part of a consulting team that would provide services. This was something that I had the pri privilege of being a faculty advisor of having uh, this project uh, of motorcycle ambulances uh, deployment in Ethiopia and Senegal. And the team did an absolutely amazing job. And again, uh, what I love about my engagement is that how much I learn every time I am with, with, the, with the teams and what they do. Another thing, as uh, Sarika uh, mentioned, is the kind of research that we're doing uh, that I have been uh, engaged with uh, colleagues over the past 20 years with uh, colleagues at the Anderson. And this is one example. Uh, unfortunately, with the exception of all the other slides, these are the slides I will not be able to uh, share uh, should Sarika wants to share with you. But practically, we were working on 
looking at PPEs related to fire and related to flood. So emergency management, em disaster preparedness and so forth. And when COVID came, we pivoted on what kind of surge capacity pre preparation do we need to have? And this practically by moving the sliders, depending on the population, rate of infection, uh, rate of recovery and so forth, we will be able to both on an epidemiological model on saying that if the spread stage is moving into, is it mild, moderate, and whether it would be recovered or not, and get a model of from a spread all the way to either recovery or death, that would give us a model of what kind of population we're going to expect. And then putting it in a patient flow model and as a toolkit is that this would come in to tell me what do I need when it comes in on the combination that how many beds do I need? One big issue is that uh, the human resources, you know, the staffing issue that we, we are looking at and right now, it's a major challenge, especially for organizations like uh, VA. We hire people, it takes us anywhere between three to six months and we can lose them in two weeks because there are other people that would provide better pay and uh, better compensation uh, system. But overall, bed capacity, human resources, ventilator capacity, what do we have? Again, it takes time to go from one to the other and PPE. So this is, when you look at it, these are the kind of decision process type of things in the courses that you learn from operations management, operation research and decision support. So to the end of the conversation, again, why MBA? I personally, uh, going from engineering and finance background into MBA that was back in 1981, many doors opened. I came into healthcare because of my MBA, not because of my engineering or the finance area. It expands your peripheral horizon, peripheral vision. Why now? Sooner is better than later, uh, practically because of the return on investment, the present value, you have longer period of recapturing this. Uh, Brandon uh, Paolo would address the why now a little bit better than I would. Why here, I can tell you that the kind of things that I shared with you, that uh, because of the campus availability and regardless of the fact that we are COVID or not COVID, we still have the same capability of connectivity and the type of things that are available with people within campus, within University of California. So when you look at it from a small family to the extended family, which we call it the power of 10, the, it's limitless. So I, this, if I wanted to put my kid to school, this would be the place. If I wanted to go for my MBA, this would be the, the place. The reason that I am engaged, continue to be engaged past retirement, you know, going through my third retirement process is uh, the learning. It's, um, you know, the MBA that I have is nothing like what you would be getting or Brandon has received. It's, uh, I have the same alphabets, but I can say I don't have the same quality of, I did not receive the same quality of education, although it was, you know, Texas A&M was one of the best at that time. Uh, nonetheless, what I see is happening nowadays, um, I would love to go back to school. So with that, um, questions and comments, I'm open to your comments or questions. Actually, you know what, Professor Higigi, thank you so much for that. I think just in the interest of time, maybe we can uh, hold all questions until the end, if that's okay with you. If you don't yes. mind staying and uh, listening to our wonderful panel. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, appreciate it. So um, with that said, I would like to introduce our panel. And I think rather than uh, me not giving them enough justice, thought it might be nice for each uh, panelist to introduce themselves. So maybe we'll start with uh, Brandon, if you could uh, just give 
a quick overview uh, of your background and career, and then coming from the healthcare industry, what led you to get your MBA? Sure, of course. Uh, so hello, my name is Brandon Koritz. Uh, I am uh, currently the co-chief of geriatrics at UCLA and spent an amazing two years uh, getting my EMBA uh, here at Anderson. Uh, I think for me, the driver was as I was becoming more and more engaged in administrative questions and issues, there are so many things that as a clinician and as a teacher, I was poorly equipped to address that having the chance to have the vocabulary, having a chance to get some formal instruction in issues of HR, budgeting, finance, proved to be incredibly powerful. Um, it certainly put me onto a path here at UCLA that I had not expected. And I'm fond of telling people that between the time I started my MBA and two years after graduating, my title here changed 14 times. And so I became very good at doing the next job. Um, and I don't think any of those opportunities would have come along had I not chosen to pursue the MBA. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, next, uh, Nima, if you could yeah. do a quick uh, intro. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nima Alamzari. I'm Chief Scientific Officer of a company called Ritual. It's a health technology VC backed company. Um, so far we've raised, raised about $50 million as part of the venture about three years old. Um, but my background is in muscle metabolism and physiology. I did my PhD at the University of Nottingham um, in the UK uh, and transitioned to Harvard Medical School where I was faculty for a number of years uh, before joining industry. Thank you, Nima. And uh, what led you to pursue your MBA? Yeah, I mean, I so I had the technical background, um, but saw a big gap between what's known in research and the sciences and what's available to consumers. The, the area where, you know, my training um, has been focused on is in the intersection of nutrition, exercise, fitness, um, drugs or genetic uh, interventions, uh, particularly with relation to muscle mass and disease, uh, muscle um, mass, strength and function in, in sports and recovery. So um, kind of wanted to just bring um, similarly, you know, a, a toolbox, a skill set um, uh, to, to develop businesses and kind of speak the lingo um, in commercial enterprise. So yeah, the courses for business creation option, um, entrepreneurship venture initiation, um, really understanding uh, p &Ls, um, strategy, pulling in marketing to develop a business plan that uh, VC folks, you know, won't laugh you off. That was the goal. <laughs> Certainly felt like um, I got that out of the program. Yeah, very enriching to my to my background. Yeah, thank you so much, Nima. Uh, Mia. Hi, my name is Mia Tepper, and I'm an EMBA from the class of 2011. And the uh, career that I'm in now is the medical laboratory, which now is on the forefront of everyone's mind with COVID. So if you didn't know what a laboratory did before and you didn't understand the important parts about reproducibility of results and sensitivity, et cetera, now you're learning a little bit about my world. So I've been doing this for almost 30 years and I started at the entry level at the client services and worked my way all the way up to the COO position after I got my MBA. So from entry level to C-suite, that would not have happened without getting my MBA. I absolutely um, was propelled to the top. It was something I was already doing, but I wasn't really getting the recognition or the support until I emerged from the MBA program. And um, another reason why I wanted to get my MBA from UCLA is because I'm a double Bruin. So I, love <laughs> I like to say when I walk on campus, it's my Disneyland. It's my happiest place on campus. <laughs> Um, I just get a big smile when I walk on campus, the same as I did when I was a senior in high school and I toured the campus. So uh, there really wasn't a choice for me. I did look at other schools because I have family. I have four kids. I wanted something in the LA area. Um, but this, I knew, I knew Anderson was for me. And part of that reason is that I find the students as well as the faculty to be very smart, but very humble. And that's just, that's just how I live my life. And that's what I wanted for that environment. Um, so I hope that gives you a little introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, Chidinma. Yes. Hi. Thanks for having me here, Sir Erica. Of course. Um, thank you. 
Absolutely. Um, so I'm medical director at UCLA Health. Um, I'm a pulmonologist by training, pulmonary and critical care medicine. And I actually chose to do the MBA because, um, you know, I've been a clinician all, you know, not all my life, but all my professional career. And I felt a lot of frustration in that role because it's not just... Oh, I think we lost you. ...by the ability of the system to actually allow me I'm not sure if uh, you can hear us. I don't know if my patients, um, my my search for an MBA was started by that frustration. And so um, I'm very happy I went through it. You know, I started off the program two years ago purely as a physician. And my goal at the start of the program was to be 50-50, 50% clinical medicine, 50% administration and sort of strategy quality work. And that's where I am now. And so, um, there is no way, I'm not gonna sell myself short, but I don't think that would have happened without the MBA. Um, the key things I think I took away from the MBA program was just really having that sense of confidence and having that sense of, you know, that you're capable of being able to step in a room and speak and have people listen to you um, because what you have to say and what you're adding is valid. Um, you know, I was very comfortable in the clinical world, but when it came to sort of key decision making when it comes to the business of medicine, I didn't feel I had that background. But, you know, after that experience, um, I think it was more a change of mindset. I don't think they didn't teach me about the business of medicine. That's not what this <laughs> program's about. But essentially, I learned how to ask the right questions, how to go in there and speak confidently enough that people say, oh, OK, you actually you actually know what you're talking about. about. So um, that was really key. OK, thank you so much. Um, your audio might be cutting out a little bit. Just wanted to let you know in case I accidentally interrupt you. I'm sorry about that. So um, uh, if we could um, let's see, share one or two highlights of your EMBA experience at UCLA, and maybe Nima, we could start with you for this one. Yeah, sure. I, um, I was pretty um, set on kind of getting all the, all the tools that I could with regards to um, business creation. So that theme of entrepreneurship um, was really important to me within the course. So I, I kind of exploited or maximized my exposure to anything within um, entrepreneurship that would go into the BCO, um, which is, I think, um, one of the key um, drivers for me joining UCLA was the fact that the faculty and the programs were so well geared towards um, the entrepreneurship side of, of business. So yeah, highlights for me were um, like EBI, like that it's kind of a stepwise process for me um, within the course. So I picked up these courses along the way and you build a business plan within entrepreneurship um, venture initiation to um, business plan development and then you take that onto the BCO. So within each iteration, my business plan was just getting better and better such that we we're able to join competitions, do fast pitches, which we won, get to know the faculty in that area and then build up, you know, a six, six month project that, you know, was a deep dive in research and building that business plan to, to a final um, presentation um, with some key requirements that is, you know, tangible and a realistic business. And you'd be assessed on the, you know, merit of your plan and ideas um, at the end by faculty, both within UCLA, but also, um, you know, uh, business people on the outside would also, you know, give input and coaching along the way. So I just love that journey. Um, it's certainly, you know, going in, I already had a formed idea of what I wanted to do as it related to a business, but coming out of it totally shifted all the way from you know what consumer we're going after to actually the mechanics um, of the business and how the business model was was running. So um, yeah, that, those were my highlights. And the output is something that I still reference. I've got you know material that I bring on to my employees, to my teams um, that kind of gives some structure to how we do things in an organization of you know 80 people. It's been tremendously valuable as a manager, but also tremendously uh, valuable as an entrepreneur. Thank you, Numa. Um, Mia, some the one or two highlights of your EMBA experience. Okay, so um, one was the international travel opportunities. I studied international management and coming from a very small medical laboratory, I really wanted to expand my horizons. And um, part of the goal, which we're still working on, is to take this global because we do laboratory testing for a rare type of cancer called neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, you may recall some people like Steve Jobs or Aretha Franklin who passed from this. 
And I really believe that with the recent research that's been done, some of our lab tests have been shown to, uh, to, to further the progression-free survival and the overall survival of these cancer patients with these blood tests. So part of my international management was wanting to see the world and learn how I could bring these tests to market. So that's something that we're still working on and very excited about. And the other thing is that in my role as class president, I've had a lot of board opportunities opened up to me. So when you're class president, you're immediately on the Anderson Board of Directors, which I stayed on for 10 years. And then I also became Anderson Women President, which is an affinity group while you're a student and when you graduate, just to try to keep the pulse of the students around and keep all the women connected. Um, you know, we're a small group. I know we're, I know we're getting more, but we're usually around 30% of a class, although we'd like that to be much higher. So um, we have to really work a little extra to stay connected and networked. And so that was really fun. I did that for three years. Great, thank you. My, my sister who is an EMBA alum is part of that board and loves, loves, loves being a part of that community. It's a really strong connected community for sure. We have lots of fun. We don't do any fundraising. We just have fun events. Some are silly, like National Grilled Cheese Day. Some are serious, like <laughs> women on boards. Um, we try to run the gamut of all the different activities. We try to do social networking, philanthropy, and educational. So, you know, it's a lot of everything, but we just try to hit it all. Okay, thank you, Mia. Uh, Chidima, a little bit about your experience. And, and I know that you had a different tail end experience than the other panelists since you were there during the shift to uh, remote learning during COVID. Yeah. Um, so, on the whole, I think the two main things I took away from the MBA program were the contacts and the friends I made. Um, it's a, such a short yet incredibly intense experience um, being with these people in addition to juggling family life, in addition to juggling work life, etc. Um, but nonetheless, you get you bond um, with your colleagues and your classmates. And, you know, in February, when the lockdown um, began and we transitioned to a virtual um, environment. That certainly was hard because a lot of the bonding that we did was before classes, in between the breaks, you know, sitting down and afterwards going out for drinks. And obviously in the current environment, that's not something that we can do anymore. You know, despite saying that though, my goal in the program was two things. First of all, the alumni network. That's why I chose UCLA, just because you have such phenomenal people that you have access to, not just in your classmates, but a broader group. You know, Maya's talking about the um, women's group as well. Um, and then the other part of this was um, my one of my favorite classes actually was a negotiation class, which was actually purely online. And um, it was phenomenal because you could do like breakaway groups and really learn how to do real world negotiations, which is something that I always found out to be a weakness of mine. So with the out of class material, you know, the books you're reading, the articles you're reading, that really nicely supplemented everything. So I didn't find that with the negotiation class, which was again, my favorite course, it didn't, it didn't actually significantly change um, the, the um, quality of the class in any way. Um, however, you know, I was obviously very thankful to have that first um, year and a half of the class that was in person um, that, you know, I, because again, it just allows you to form these closer types of connections to people. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Brandon. I, I would actually emphasize the value of the alumni network. Um, from my perspective, uh, that was by far the best learning. Uh, some of the informal learning that occurs, you know, between lectures, whether you're on a lunch break together, or having a snack in the hallway, that, that's when people who do finance or accounting for a living take pity on people like me <laughs> who have a clue about what's going on, put their arm around our shoulders and say, look, let me tell you how it really works. And in five minutes, they've outlined the key points of the lectures in a way that makes sense to my dumb brain. The second piece is how folks really work together. And in medical school, I wasn't accustomed to collaboration. Here, there were accountants who were giving up their weekends to come in and give tutorials to folks like me for whom this was completely new. Who does that? And it's <laughs> amazing. Um, and I guess the final point is I now have a network of people that I can tap 
for any kind of question that comes up. Uh, a few years ago, there was a really sticky administrative issue. Uh, I called one of my colleagues who happened to deal with that. And in two minutes, he had solved a problem that had stymied us for weeks. I mean, it's just amazing. This alumni network is amazing. And, and if I may just deviate for just one sure, second of and ask, answer one of the questions that somebody mm -hmm. posed on the chat line. You're asking a question about how you pay for the degree. Um, let me caution you. Let me say that there's two metrics that you really need to think about. There's time and there's money. You can always borrow money. The issue really, and, and I hope the other panelists would agree, is you got to make sure you've got the time. You've got to make sure that you've got your family resources lined up, that they're supportive, and you've got your work resources lined up so that they're supportive. As long as you do that homework and have the time to do the degree, you can always borrow the money. Thank you. I, you're, you are absolutely correct. So there you go. And actually, it leads into actually my final question before I open it up for questions, which is, and then um, maybe, Brandon, you, if you want to start with this one, um, for those who are on this call thinking about pursuing the MBA, may, may be a bit hesitant or maybe very excited, what advice do you have uh, to offer the people on here who may be in the middle or just thinking about getting the MBA? Yeah, I, I think that if, if you've decided to be here, you've already decided you probably want to do it. It's just a matter of finding out whether this is the right time for you. Um, and that's a conversation you have to have with your family and your boss and your work colleagues, because as long as those pieces fall together, it, it's a great decision. Thank you. Uh, Mia, one piece of advice for people who might be in the ruminating process? <laughs> I think what Brandon said really resonates with me. I think you know in your heart why you need this. Do you need this? you know, like so many of us have said, to further the skills that maybe we didn't have. Maybe you've got hard skills, maybe you need soft skills. You know, the, the MBA is just such a wonderful way to propel your career. And like everyone has said, make great lifelong connections and do things that you maybe didn't have the confidence to do before. I agree, you know, with what's been said here that it just makes such a difference. And you know in your heart if this is right for you or not. And you know, I, I put a comment back in the chat that this is something in terms of loans, I think of it like a mortgage. I made the investment in myself. No one paid for this for me, but me. Um, so, you know, if you want to invest in yourself, it's going to pay off. My salary has more than tripled since I graduated. So I'm going to pay those student loans back slowly. There's the government's not going anywhere and neither are the student loans. So you just pay them off according to what you can do and don't worry about it. Um, you know, really, I mean, how much time do you have for your brain to be at this capacity and, and do this work. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, I've also um, written a book about going back to school, being a working mom with four kids. So if you're at all interested, I have just a real rudimentary website started, which is sincelifesnotlinear.com. So if you want to go there, I just have a sample chapter up. And if you email me, I'll send you a specific chapter about how to go back to school in case it's been 20 years for you like it was for me. So since life's not linear.com, email me and happy to share a chapter with you on this specific topic. Thank you. Thanks, Mia. And we'll be sharing everyone's LinkedIn profile after the event, you know, in the follow up email. So thank you for that. Um, Nima. Um, yeah, for, for me, I, th I think it's quite important to know wh where you're headed in your career, because you're going to navigate the MBA and get what you want out of it. There's a lot of courses, there's a lot of tracks, um, but having some inclination of what you think an MBA might do for you, I think will be useful and, and just keep you more focused within the program. Um, so I think it is worth asking, you know, that question as you start to think about, you know, the syllabus and the commitment, because it is a big commitment. Like the two years for me were not, not only a time commitment, um, but it was a commitment, you know, work-life balance. And you may have, you know, pretty demanding careers. You may have families. Um, but I tell you that the, the period makes you the most efficient human being that you can be. Um, and I've certainly taken that on to other parts of my life afterwards. Um, I know there's a bit, bit of a question about, you know, the financial uh, commitments as well, which which can be a little bit daunting when you when you look at it. But I think it's well worth the investment. I, I totally agree with Mia um, in terms of kind of looking at it as a as a payback. So I I already recouped that to to pay that off pretty pretty quickly. 
Um, so I certainly see that as a, as a good investment. It certainly opened up uh, do doors for me and opportunities for me also. Um, just a note though, you know, I, if you do have employers that, uh, you know, value your contributions or can see the value of what an MBA might do, whether it be for your own personal development or your team, it's worth leveraging that um, dialogue to get people on board because you may find yourself having partial um, funding from your employer um, and that's really helpful even at, you know at the beginning of mine it's 50% it's very helpful um, so I think you know bring bring that on don't be shy to bring it and find that mutual value you know you're gonna bring this on for your own career you may go somewhere else but there may be value there shared by your organization or your employer thank you thank you for that uh, Chidinma yeah, just to echo what everyone has said, you know, my, my thinking and in going into the MBA was that I only get this one go around, you know, you have one life to live and you make of it the best you will. And so I made a decision to um, do the MBA, you know, part of it was actually watching my sister who's a member 2017 and just watching that transformation in her from the outside, from someone who was somewhat shy and reserved to essentially just running her company <laughs> um, at the end of it. Um, awesome. you know, yeah, and you know, I was like, this is what I want, you know, and this is so has been something on my mind for a long time. Eventually I decided that it was either now or never. And obviously immediately I applied and got in, I got pregnant, uh, which I'd been trying to get pregnant for four years prior to that. And so, but nonetheless, I thought this was important enough for me and also for my family um, and for what I wanted to do, which is actually sort of help people on a broader scale. You know, as a physician, there's only, you only touch the person in front of you. However, when you're still talking about um, expanding the business of medicine, expanding access to care to underserved groups, you're touching communities, you're touching whole cities, you know? And so this is when I thought about what my 10 year plan looked like, my 15 year plan looked like, this was something that was important enough for me that I figured, you know, pregnancy is something that you, you just do. Women have been doing it for hundreds, thousands of years. Um, so, um, you know, I went through the program and had my son. I was able to continue with doing that, not taking a break. Um, and yes, maybe I didn't get all A's in my classes, but I got, I took out of it what I needed to take out of it. Um, so again, if it's something that's important to you, if it's something that you see as really a key stepping stone to achieve that 10 year plan, 15 or 20 year plan, then go ahead because there's no time like today. We only get this one go around. Very, very nicely said. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, we do want to open it up to questions that we have about 10 minutes left uh, for either our panelists or for Professor Hagigi. Um, I'm going to take a quick run through the chats. I know you guys have been uh, asking questions in the chats. Uh, so see if there's anything here. Uh, definitely the financing kind of came, comes up. Um, I'm also going to ask uh, if anybody would like to raise their blue hand and do the blue hand feature as well if there's any questions that haven't been answered, uh, happy to uh, have that for our panelists or for Professor Higigi. Uh, you know, one question that is coming up is um, how the EMBA has impacted your life and career in unexpected ways. Uh, Nima, do you wanna start with this one? I don't know how unexpected, but um, yeah, certainly, um, you know, I, I was a uh, vice president and the head of a, a science for a company called Beachbody. Um, so I was executive level, but I, I became attractive as a C-level um, part of a new company, a new venture. So I do think that the MBA um, shows more than a technical background um, mm -hmm. and, and that C-level transition was a big one for my career. Certainly um, I think that the MBA was part of that. Um, and what was the other part? Uh, just how it's changed your life and career in unexpected ways. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mentioned a little bit about efficiency. So my um, my kind of uh, ability to do things outside of work, you know, in the evening hours and kind of get things done or work on, you know, different projects has, I think, increased by, maybe <laughs> honestly, I, I feel very um, able and capable of taking on a lot of different projects. And I think that's also been something I've been able to pass on to people that I'm working with and you know as a mentor to a number of people um, I think those frameworks and learnings are super useful for people underneath you that may be more junior and can benefit from from your training and education. Great thank you Nima. Uh, Mia an unexpected life or career impact. This is a tough question I think <laughs> I was not expecting the kind of respect that I got from people 
once I emerged from the MBA and, you know, I don't think it was also, you know, just because I was class president, but so many people in the medical industry looked at me differently. I was working in a small family business and now I just, I got attention professionally in a way that I didn't before. And there was just a whole new level of respect because I had this title. Um, and to answer, I think it's Diane's question, they said, she asked, how is the EMBA perceived versus an MBA in the world at large? Your degree says MBA. It doesn't say EMBA. It just says MBA. So it's perceived very well. And I have to say that people respect you, especially with having a family and going back to school and trying to keep all that together while running a business. Um, so it's just, it's a tremendous experience. And like Nima said, I come home and in the evenings, I'm when I'm not tired, I'm more efficient than ever because I know I can do more. You know, doing this program, you're gonna have a lot of work to do, you know, in your after work hours. Your family doesn't stop, your work doesn't stop, but somehow you manage to find a way to make it all fit in. And the nice thing is that when you've gone through this process, your family now understands that you want to do more and they let you. So they're not as reliant upon you and they're perhaps a little bit more independent. So that's what I found. Yeah, if, if, if I may build on what Nia said, um, sure. there are two key le learnings I think from this experience for me. One is to not be fearful and the second was to say no. Um, not be fearful because I literally went overnight from having zero financial responsibility to being in charge of almost one and a half billion dollars of cash flow every year. I mean, that would keep many people up at night. And then, and the second piece was uh, to say no. I became very comfortable saying, you know, I, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. You do that. And that is a very powerful lesson. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Chidinma, the one or two, I mean, I guess uh, a little baby boy was an unexpected life surprise, but if there's any other surprises uh, from, from the EMBA. Yeah, you know, one thing I wasn't expecting was the personal development I got from it as well. You know, I just found I was better at relating to people, whether it's my patients or whether it was my husband. You know, we have a lot of different communication courses, um, which I took all of them, um, even organizational um organizational behavior. Um, one of the professors, Dr. Allman, Professor Allman is phenomenal. And he's really um, down with like the soft skills side of human interactions, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Um, so the fact that I found myself to be a more patient understanding wife, <laughs> uh, <laughs> my husband was a really, really nice takeaway. And I think he benefited greatly from it as well. So. Oh, thank you so much. So, you know, we'll finish up with uh, the last question in the chat, uh, talking about the uh, folks in the class or cohort. So maybe just a little bit, because, you know, we do, and again, at Anderson, we really take efforts to make sure that there's a diverse uh, group of industries and backgrounds represented in the program. So if you could talk a little bit about the exposure that you got to people outside of the healthcare industry and how that expanded your thought process. So maybe, maybe we can start with you on that one. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of pivots, I mean, um, I guess the, the most, the biggest pivot that I saw from the class cohort was a physician, I think a new, new, neurosurgeon that basically um, opened up an Indian <laughs> restaurant, you know, in Orange County, um, the Tripoli of Indian food, you know, so I think that gives an indication of how, you know, you can go from anywhere to anything and the courses in the structural course, courses are there to facilitate that. Um, you know, from my own personal standpoint, I still think that it's a pivot from being kind of a specialized science function to more of a generalized um, C-level C position. And, and that certainly expanded areas from anywhere from, you know, the marketing and strategy side that I just didn't you know I, I touched on and thought I knew a little bit. And that totally, the education totally transformed my um, my view of that and also the, the tools that I had to uh, to tackle those um, areas. And I'll, yeah. I'll add to that because I wasn't sure, sure if he said Nia or Nima at first. No. So um, yeah, likewise with like Nima, I've had classmates that worked on Wall Street and then went and they opened up another food restaurant in Orange County. Are we talking about the same person, Will Chen? Uh, yeah, and sure. then is it Will that you're speaking about? 
no, you know? it's different. Yeah. Yeah, it's no, just a popular idea. So there we go. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and also on the other side of it, um, there was someone I knew from FEMBA who was working in you know the restaurant industry in management, and now he's working in mergers and acquisitions. So you know, really the gamut is there versus someone like me who just stays put but moves up, you know, in the in the organization and has global plans for expansion. So you really the world is your oyster. If you're going to put the time into Anderson, it's going to give to you what you put into it. So, you know, trying to really foster those relationships. And I know it's difficult during COVID while we're not together, but that's something that, you know, after the class periods, if you can spend the time to get together with your classmates and get to know them outside of just who raised their hand and knew the, you know, the answer to the question that was being posed, there's so much there that you gain from those relationships if you take the time. So it's like anything in life, what you put into it is what you're gonna get out of it. But I'm just telling you that the quality of people at Anderson is so incredible that if you don't put that extra time into the social side of it and really get to know your classmates, you're kind of missing out. So take all the opportunities you can and enjoy it. Two years goes fast. Thank you. Uh, Chidinma. Sorry, can you reiterate question? I was on the chats. I uh, you know, I know. Thank you for doing the chats. Uh, just you know, a little bit about the um, the diversity of industries and backgrounds of your cohort, and you know, for you who is in healthcare, how how was that experience working with people outside of the healthcare industry to help your thought process and expand um, other aspects of business knowledge? Yeah. So, you know, in people in my class who had pivoted significantly, most of them were actually people in the military. So we had like military commanders and, you know, Navy SEALs who decided to go into, for example, working for Amazon or um, working for Apple. And so that's really a big switch. But the fact that they didn't have that background, but nonetheless, at the end of the MBA, were able to sell themselves in such a way that they had the skills to be able to transfer that leadership skills that they had in their military background, I think was phenomenal. Um, so a lot of them have done very well. Um, from a personal perspective, um, when it comes to, um, sorry, I'm trying to, what, what was the other part, the second half of the question? Uh, just, you know, in terms of the diversity of thought and being able to learn from other people who are from outside of the healthcare industry. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the people on the panel uh, who are MDs and been through medical school, you know that you get into this sort of group think thing. I feel like medicine in some ways trains you to not think outside the box. You learn <laughs> algorithms. No, really, you learn algorithms, you learn pattern recognition. And so, you know, being um, able to sort of rub shoulders and with people in completely different industries, whether they're lawyers or whether they're um, accountants um, or whether they're entrepreneurs and have their own businesses and was really, um, a very important thing for me because I felt like another part of my brain, which essentially has been suppressed for the last 20 years of medical education, finally came alive again. And, and I, that creativity part of it, um, I was able to apply that. And so now I find myself in meetings um, actually able to apply that because again, there's a certain way the clinicians think. And so bringing that business aspect to it changes things. Thank you. Uh, Brandon, I, 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 Brandon I, I was going to say, I see, and I'm seeing his his mask on. So I just, you know, in the interest of time, I know if you have to leave. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let, let me, if I may just leave, uh, my, ironically, my patient is here. Um, in the interest of, of time, though, I particularly picked Anderson because it was a generalist program. I wasn't interested in having a healthcare slant on life. I had, had a decade of seeing the solutions healthcare posed and really wanted to understand how other industries looked at the same questions and handled things differently. That generalist approach was incredibly valuable. And I would urge anybody who's thinking about a healthcare specific program to reevaluate that. Far better decision to have the diversity that's not healthcare based. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone so much. Uh, Professor Gigi, thank you for your time and uh, the, the presentation. Pleasure. I think thank you. I find it so fascinating with you know, this new aspect of COVID in there. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, you know, we hope that this le has left you, this event has left you with a better understanding of our offerings and how the EMBA program can enhance your career in healthcare. Uh, just a reminder that we have our round one deadline on December 1st, and we're on a rolling admissions basis until May. So we look forward to seeing you at future events and answering any questions that 
you may have specific to your situation and your admissions, uh, your admissions application. But thank you again to everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you and good luck. Bye. Bye.